works. Works? OK. As well, there was the, the government people that were doing things. And they were basically trying to, keep, to be sneaky. They weren't really using or reusing much of the code. So everybody wanted to keep a low profile. There was little reuse of code. And, uh, and well, you might remember groups like 29A were, and, and computer viruses that were incredibly advanced at the level, like Metamorph, computer viruses that were able to disassemble themselves and reassemble themselves. And it was just made for fun. They weren't actually trying to be especially nasty to antivirus. That was just a nice side effect. But, and some, most of them actually didn't even have malicious payloads. They were just had a message and everything, spreading some political thing or something. So, that was the past. It was mostly handwritten. No libraries, no nothing. Like whenever there was some new variant, the guy just like adapted it to new OS or just discovered or thought of a new technique to hide itself or to stay resident in memory, hook some new interrupt, whatever. They just like wanted to evolve it a little bit. But like families were like three or four members to, to max. Or some somebody else took the virus, disassembled it and took a look and added a couple of new things. But they were very little, very small families. And there were like really interesting cases, like set mist from zombies, like amazing virus, you know, manages to insert itself into an application by disassembling and reassembling itself into the flow. Just crazy stuff. And uh, really nasty to disinfect, too, basically. So, but it has changed nowadays. Nowadays, people started realizing that, you know, writing malware can actually make you money. You can create zombie networks, or you actually can use them to send spam to. Uh, data mining for, for credit card numbers, uh, loyalty DOS attacks. Well, there has been a whole economy, uh, underground economy, developing on this. You can, you can rent these, these computer resources. Basically, they have supercomputers at their disposal that they can rent and, uh, and offer services on them, like distribution of stuff, hosting illegal websites. So these guys are making money, which in turn means that they can actually put money into developing new techniques and new resources. So the trends that we are seeing is this professionalization of, of malware. We're seeing all these families of banking trojans, uh, spam bots, uh, spyware, and uh, where, where they actually start adding things and start modifying in a way that they create these families. Uh, the families arise from, from uh, the fact that they made small modifications specifically targeting not being detected anymore by, by antivirus engines. So. These guys have heavy economic constraints, and it's a very wild environment out there, which is very interesting from an economics point of view, because there is no subsidies to keep companies running. Whatever is bad is going to die. Whatever is good is going to persist. And you will even see viruses fighting against each other. It's, it's as wild as it gets. And uh, so they will just try to reach as big, as big as a user base as they can in order to you know, harvest the resources of the computers. They want to you know, make as much uh, use of uh, an exploit or a certain technique as they can for as little resources. So they will you know, try to rebuild and build on top of that. They have their own uh, development environments and libraries in order to build onto those techniques. And uh, so they've moved to developing from assembler into more advanced languages, C, C++, where they have their own libraries. And they actually have release cycles. Like lots of worms have uh, um, kill dates where they will actually stop working or they will download updates or, or they will you know, give uh, pass to something newer and it's going to supersede them in technology or, or fixing some bug. So there is like, really a malware industry. So, and that presents problems when you look at antivirus signatures and they work. Because these guys nowadays, I mean, the, the, the thing for them is not being detected. And antivirus signatures are relatively primitive in that they are basically checksum based, which is not necessarily something you can, you can blame them on them. You, I mean, antivirus have been a bit sleeping on the Lawrence for a long time because, uh, I mean, they didn't really need to invest in technology to detect because it was pretty easy. You know, you just got fast. You could check some and tell, hey, this is the same thing. But um, nowadays, uh, there is like this influx of stuff that is released continuously. There's like tons, like hundreds, thousands of samples released in a day. And they really, because they need to see every single file in order to create signatures. Um, and it's really easy to break them. It's a real problem for them. They really have to invest into, into more advanced technology. So this, this signature-based uh, uh, technology, basically, doing checksums of the files is limited in that respect. And uh, it's brittle just because it's very easy to modify. I mean, uh, th in this case, it's, we're not even looking at changing the application and stuff. You're just looking at changing the file. But the same application is changing the file, change some bytes, and some signatures already won't work on it. And it's very local that the, within the same application, you can just change very specific locations, and it will still run. 
So illustratively, we could actually write a small Python script that we just get a, a, a known malware that is detected and modify it and create a, a like just by modifying a byte at a time and creating lots of different files with that with different bytes modified. You will see. You will try to get something that still runs and is not detected. So you can even automate that process of generating a different strands that are not detected by normal antivirus engines, uh, which leads into something that we can actually call offline polyformism, where they can automate the whole process. They can actually get the updates from the from uh, an antivirus vendor and then try to just batch or automate the process of, of finding a, a variant of that malware that is not detected by these signatures. And whenever it's done, they just release it. They can just start changing bytes randomly. They can actually recompile, uh, and they can go into more advanced things, like changing the obfuscation, changing the packers, uh, reorganizing the binary, changing optimizations. We'll talk about that later. Uh, in order to make a bit of a different binary that they will release. And nowadays we serve online scanners like Virus Total and some of the others out there that they get basically real-time feeds from the antivirus companies. You can even make a script that fetches it, like launches it to the service, waits for the result, you get the result, and then once it's not detected anymore by a given amount of antivirus engines, these guys run like 30 or 40, uh, you can choose when to release the, the new piece of malware. So all automated, how nice. So it would be nice if you had some sort of technique in order to, to, to look at things at a higher level. So the combination of this automation with the current technology employed in antivirus signatures makes it kind of a bad, you know, bad combination. Just because uh, antivirus really need to see the, the computer virus in order to generate the signature. And nowadays, like guys, like for instance, that write Storm, they don't even care about that. They just like con constantly release a stream of different variants. And they will just release a uh, different stream next day. So, you know, if it's detected in 24 hours, we don't care. We're in the new, new batch, you know. It's like, it's not relevant anymore. So, and there is lots of ways of achieving different, uh, different variants of, of malware, not only just by changing the bytes, but now this even just by changing comp compiler settings, changing the optimization settings, would lead to r certain rest uh, structural modifications at the level of, of, of like byte code, the actual assembler code change in the, in the, in the program, which obviously will, will make any signatures of it mostly useless because the actual bytes in the, in the program change, even the semantics still the same. So what people have been looking uh, into are, are trying to automate the process and look at it a bit of a higher level, hopefully. And uh, there are four common different approaches to this uh, that I've been actually tried. Um, first, and I'll try to discuss all of them and, and see which points they have in favor and which against them. Uh, first one would be behavioral classification. Basically, in this case, you see what the application does and uh, try to work with that. And if you see an application that behaves similarly, uh, you try to assume it's the same. So in this case, it would, you would be actually able to tell, coming, like getting a new sample from the, la from, from the while, you know, like your mail stream, whatever, you would be able to see whether uh, it, re it relates to anything you have in your database or not by behavior. So you don't need to wait an antivirus signature. You already know that, okay, this looks pretty similar in behavior to something really nasty that I have in my database, so let's just stop it. Engrams and mperms, which is like, fancy terms to refer basically to relatively advanced statistics you do at the code level. You basically look at the whole application at the, at the code level and, uh, and, and try to generate certain mathematical constructs, certain vectors that you would then compare and will try to tell you how close the code of one application is to another. This is and has worked really well in some cases, but now this has very important limitations. We'll see them in a second. Basic block distance goes a little bit along the same lines as, as the previous one. It tries to work at a low level, at the basic block level of the application, which captures some features, but uh, I tend to believe it forgets or, or misses really important ones. And then I'll move with what will be the main topic of this structural classification, which I believe is the strongest one because captures most of the semantics of the program and in addition at different levels. So that if you miss some of the information, it's not, not it's all lost, you know, you can still, like some of the other information is gonna contribute to, to tell you that this, yeah, this is, looks pretty bad, looks similar to something I already have. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about behavioral classification. How does it work? Well, basically, it just listens to what happens when the virus runs. You can do this in a million different ways. You can hook APIs. You can do it at kernel level, look at syscalls, um, whatever. Like, as long as you get a, like a stream of things that happen in the system. 
So what they do basically they archi archive this as strings of, of, of API calls. And uh, so whenever they get a new piece of malware, they will do, do the same process and uh, get another stream, and then they would use techniques like Levenstein's distance, which basically uh, gets two strings and calculates how many insertions, removals, or substitutions of these entries you need to do in order to make one into the other. So if you just need to switch a couple of them to make one identical to the other, well, it's, it assumes it's basically the same stream of, of, of behavior to some extent. While if it takes a long, t you know, a lot of time, if you get an application, you know, whatever, Notepad, and you get a virus, the only thing they're going to have in common is probably GUI, uh, GUI APIs, which uh, really doesn't tell you much. And the, like Levenstein distance is going to be huge, and uh, it's going to tell you this has nothing to do. So this is interesting. Um, it doesn't care about certain things. It doesn't care how it runs, really, as long as it runs and you can capture it. You don't really care how many threads it runs. You can run in some problems with the threads if things get reordered, but most of the time there are certain patterns. You could even like specialize it per thread. And extracting the information is relatively easy, you know, like applications that hook API calls, you know, or you can do it with Oli, with Oli debug, it just, or scripting nowadays with all the Python frameworks that exist for debugging. You can automate the whole process. But it has problems. It has shortcomings. It actually has to run. You cannot just like get later to the system, dump the memory, and look at it because you need to see it running. You need to see it doing the bad things in order to get this stream of things that, or of, of happenings of API calls that you're going to use to classify it. And um, it's relatively weak in that uh, you, you can obfuscate it by um, just adding random calls. In, you, you imagine you have two vi you're creating a virus and you have virus A and then in virus V you have like lots of random API calls that don't do really anything useful. You can just open and close a file, but do it a million times. So that's going to add a lot of entries into these, into these behavioral patterns that when they try to match them, it's not going to really look similar. Although it's garbage, it's not really useful, but it's really easy to obfuscate. You basically inject <coughs> junk behavior on it and it's really trivial to do. And for each variant, you can script this. So each variant is going to have a different junk inserted. So the, the signatures, the, the Levenstein's distance is going to be pretty, it's going to be quite different. So it has some good things. It captures some of the semantics that we will see the ne next two methods don't really capture semantics because they look too low. They basically will look at the instruction level. Where the behavior actually captures semantics of the application to some extent. Basically, here's the stories it's being told. It just goes through all that happens. Limitation is that only through all that happens. If there is a backdoor that will trigger a specific case, won't see that unless it actually happens to run. So it's 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 a relatively good method with some shortcomings. Then moving to the next one, the engrams and mperms. The basic thing is you just get the disassembly of the program, and uh, for the engrams, you just count how many how many times uh, a certain set of instructions appears. On, the whole, on a basic block level or through the whole program. Basically, just taking uh, uh, two like, pairs of instructions or triplets or whatever the N is, run it across all the program. And mperms is very similar, but you don't take uh, ordering into account. So if you have instructions like move, move, push, uh, and push, move, move, those, those are going to be different engrams because the ordering is different, but it's going to be the same uh, mperms because it's the same instruction, just different order. It's just going to give you different numbers. And in some cases, it, it captures better the, 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 the differences because compilers, when they compile, they uh, tend to do uh, instruction reordering. If you change a couple of things just for optimization reasons, like op instruction scheduling, so the mperms probably is a little bit more flexible. It's not, not going to fall for that. It's going to still find things similar, uh, even they have been reordered, if the, if the ordering didn't matter in that case. So basically, once you have this, it just creates vectors, like big dimensional vectors with these numbers, with these counts of mperms. And what you do, basically, is you do a do dot product uh, of these ones are divided by the absolute value. What that means is that if they are very similar, the value is going to be close to 1. And if they are orthogonal, uh, it's going to be 0. So I mean, you're going to get all these numbers. And if th all these numbers are pretty much the same, you're going to get two vectors that are pretty much like very close aligned. And the closer they are, the product is going to be closer to 1. The more divergent up to like 90 degrees, like if there's like totally nothing to do, um, then the product will be 0. So uh, it, it works for classifying stuff. And uh, if you apply this to like 
long time, like five, six years ago, strands of, of malware like MyMails and MyDooms, where they were, they were really not putting that much effort into the obfuscation. They were just adding a new feature, recompiling, same compiler settings, same everything. In those cases, this gives really good, really good results. It classifies that family really well. But um, it has the problem that it's really easy to break, as we will see in a second. Uh, it's really fast. It's not localized because it looks at the whole binary, so that's some of the advantages. And uh, the, uh, the um, mperms is actually resilient to cold reordering, mostly, and resilient against what? You lost signal. Oh, <laughs> long time ago or? Oh no. Oh, okay. I was like talking here for half an hour. We lost signal. Okay. So it's resilient against different kinds of modifications to the code, just because it uh, abstracts a little bit, like the, the ordering. But uh, it has problems, like uh, the code motion. If you, depending on the window size you are looking at instructions, if you get be beyond that, you can actually break the, 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 that resilience. Um, average basic block is relatively small, and, and actually that's the case when, I mean, the smaller you get, the, the, the less general you get. Like the last point mentioned, like when n equals 1, you're looking at a basic instruction level, which that means that you're basically doing a histogram of the mnemonics of the program, which is even it still works in quite some cases, not, not nowadays, not for, for like actual strands of malware. Uh, still gives fairly interesting results, though, and like for, for toy game, for, for toy play with malware. So it has shortcomings, and it's really easy to fool to. Um, well, as well, if you actually use different compiler settings, because that's going to modify a lot, the, the, or could potentially modify a lot the instruction set that is used, or even change compilers, go from Visual C, uh, Visual C to GCC, something that you know, has a slightly different optimization, has a slightly different weights about which mnemonics or which instructions to use, is going to produce a different, uh, slightly different binary, which might break a little bit this thing. At the level of uh, fooling it, we would then only need to insert uh, large amounts of instructions that, uh, in different pieces of malware that don't correlate with each other. So it's a little bit like the junk in the, in, the, in the behavioral classification, where you insert lots of things that do nothing, but actually make it difficult to match these two vectors. It would be similar here. We could add a, a lot, a lot of noise, a lot of instructions in one variant of the, of the family, and another variant of the family, different set of instructions. And the point where like, these two vectors will start having values that make them divergent, because this guy has like, a lot of a certain combination, this guy has a lot of certain combination. So, and that is very easy to automate, because it doesn't even need to be code that gets executed. It can be executed. It can be code that is like, you know, is referenced but never run, but it, you know, it has like, a really big bias at the level of, of the instructions that are used. So again, can be broken or, or made to perform poorly. And well, why it breaks is basically what I went through. You get that vectors misaligned and uh, values increasingly close to zero. Then another approach. Uh, would be the basic block distance, which is a bit funky to explain, although it uses uh, some of the techniques we already saw, like the Levenstein distance to calculate the difference. Um, but in order to actually calculate um, the, the, the data that will be used to measure the distance, something called Bloom filters are used. And uh, let's see if I can quickly explain this. Uh, Bloom filters basically uh, are so that you have a set of hash functions uh, you will get every single basic block fitted through that set of hash functions. The hash functions output will be between 0 and n, and you will have a vector in the end, where the entries on that vector are going to be set to 1 if you fit the, if the output of the hash function for that thing told you that that index should be set to 1. And in order to actually try to make this clear, um, so if you have two different basic blocks and you uh, send them through the hash functions, you will have k of this. Um, the output of every of each hash function is going to be a number between 0 and n, which is the length of the vector. So you put the, the basic block, whatever measure, whatever numbers you extract from the basic block through the hash, it's going to tell you a number, and then you go to the vector, to that index, and set it to 1, right? So the idea is that if you fit two basic blocks through the hashes, and give the same indices, then you're going to find indices in this vector in the same positions for both of them. So if you have ones in all of them, 
then it's going to be that that vector is already there. It's kind of a fuzzy uh, set uh, probabilistic matching. So basically what you do is you feed a lot of data into it. It's going to set lots of ones for all the members that are into the set. And then you will get a new thing. And you want to know whether it's in the set or not. You run it through the same hashes. And if you find ones in all of the positions output from the hashes, then you know that that element is very likely to be in that set. So what they do is basically they feed basic blocks, and they basically generate a signature for the whole program, telling them, OK, this program has all these set of basic blocks. And then you get this vector, like relatively long vector. I mean, the longer it is more specific it's going to be for every application. So then if you have two applications, yeah, well, another one, another, another virus, you feed, you create another, uh, another vector like this, and do you do 11 things distance between these two. If the basic blocks are pretty much the same, the actual vectors are going to be pretty close as well. So that's, that's another way of going about it. Um, it has some really good advantages that it scales really well. Um, problems would be uh, you have to be careful about the hash function, how it's implemented probabilistically, how likely it's to, to, to actually be unique for certain uh, basic blocks. But as well, it has to be a bit flexible because you want that you want it to be tolerant to certain easy modifications like instruction reordering, which happen really, really commonly. So it works. It's a good approach. But it, I, I see it more for an f useful for non-malware environment where people try actually try to break it because it can be broken. Like uh, heavy code modifications, like, like restructuring the code heavily or injecting lots of junk instructions will basically make the basic blocks look different enough that, again, these vectors will, will, will not really give you a good measure of, of distance. This is really interesting in-house if you have a really large collection of binaries that you need to classify. Like, I, I don't know, I've heard of these being used in Microsoft to classify their own binaries. Uh, so in that case, when you know that the binaries are non-malicious and don't in, not intentionally tend to break it, it actually works. It's a, it's a cute approach. And now we go into the one that I actually like which is a structured classification. And, um, and as we will see, it relies on lots of different inputs from an application in order to construct the measure of what's going to be used for the similarity. Uh, it's based on uh, Bindiff technology, which is one of our products, which basically um, can take two binaries and that's a structural comparison. We'll, we'll actually go step by step into the structural comparison in a second, which basically looks at the binary at, diff at lots of different levels, trying to extract. I think from all these approaches is the actual one that gets closer to extracting the semantics, not really relying on instructions or the instruction reordering. It doesn't even need to look at instructions. It tries to extract the semantic from all the relationships between functions. Maybe you can put it along the lines of what Google tries to do with PageRank and the web. You know, they look at the links. They don't necessarily look only at the text of the pages. They look at the relationships to decide what's important. This is a little bit similar. You look at the relationship between functions to try to say what's important, what's not, and what relates to another binary. So we have been used this, uh, using this uh, not only for malware, but for patch analysis, trying to find where things have been changed from Microsoft to Microsoft Patch. And uh, yeah, and what they don't tell about what they have changed, which is really interesting. <laughs> so in order to implement this, we need uh, we need things. We need an unpacked executable, which this this applies with to any other approach. If you want to actually classify the the malware, you need it to be unpacked. And actually, that proves to be one of the the hardest like barriers of entry, like getting the actual malware unpacked. I mean, 80, 90 percent of the of the malware out there is easy to unpack, but that 10 percent or 5 percent remaining tends to be harder and harder. So we need to disassemble the executable fully. Um, for instance, behavioral analysis does not need that. It just basically listens to whatever happens. Uh, we need to strike the flow graph. So we really need a, an involved uh, disassembly process. We need to get as much as we can of it. Um, we, dis we do some restructuring, some uh, very silly optimizations at the level of removing unconditional branches. Because every everything that is unconditional, like if you have two basic blocks split, but there is just an arrow between them. You just collapse them because it doesn't really make sense logically. And it's basically running an optimization stage, trying to reduce everything to a canonical form so that we will actually run more generically into that. So if two programs, like one of them, has not split a basic block and another has, just by collapsing every single instance we find, we're more likely to match these two basic blocks. So we try to extract all the call graph and flow graphs from, from an application. 
and then we run the, the, the matching actually in these in these graphs. So probably, I mean, if you have ever reverse engineered anything or, or thought of, of, of software engineering, I mean, it's pretty obvious that uh, applications can be viewed as graphs. Um, the call graph, the relationship, relationships between functions in a, in a, in a binary uh, is a graph. You can express the calls like that. The functions within a binary, you can split them and represent them as a graph, where the edges represent the connections between the basic blocks, basically the, the true-false branches. Even the instructions you can represent as a graph, a really stupid and simple graph, which is basically a, a line, a sequential line. But you know, if you want to go all abstract, you can. So it, it's a graph. And uh, as a quick example, well, this will be a very small application. You know, this is like an entry point. Whatever, probably the other one that is disconnected is some sort of a thread that is not directly referenced. And then the, the set of all applications. Usually, the leaves tend to be APIs because, well, we stop at that level. You know, we stop at the level that interacts with the operating system. So usually, the leaves are API calls, imported symbols from DLLs, um, or otherwise atomic functionality within the software. Then an example of uh, um, a flow graph for, an, uh, for a function would be this, which every node represents a sequential uh, set of instructions. Um, and the relations between them represent conditional and unconditional branches, or switch case statements, or any other kind of flow, um, control flow structure. So we, ha we have this set of graphs of graphs. So the good thing is that these graphs capture a lot of the semantic of the program of the meaning that the developer intended. You, it's difficult to keep the same meaning uh, changing a lot the application, because basically means they're going to be changing the calls and the, the order the calls are made. So th that shifts a lot of the semantics, but moves them away. So the only things that are actually changing, for instance, let's imagine that some guys change all the string operations to secure string operations. That, that's going to change the calls. But still, within the context, two functions uh, in the program, even the the the, the, the subfunctions are going to be different. There are string functions still, and the context upwards of those functions is going to be the same. So we can still match them. Uh, adding logic to a, f a function changes the changes the flow graph. That's exactly the case when uh, you you fix a patch. Most of the times we see just an, an extra condition is added that you know goes to the end, exit, exit returns an error, an error uh, raises an, an exception whatever, they detect that something is outside the, the, the boundaries. So, but still, those are very small changes. And most of the times, we can actually tell that the function is the same, and actually that a basic block was added or removed. So again, semantics are kept very well. Uh, compiler optimizations change a lot of the software. Uh, if you go really heavy, if you go like with heavy inline, like function inline in uh, uh, loop and rolling, or, or the nastiest one starts to be like a um, profiler-guided optimization, where you basically instrument the binary, run it in test cases that are assumed to be typical test cases, and you get hot, uh, hot traces of where the application is most commonly running. And then you use all this information to recompile the binary, optimize to keep all these hot paths, hot paths really close, so they are together in memory, so you need less pages in memory active. They are together in the cache of the processor, so it needs to heat less times the memory, which is really expensive. Really, really hardcore optimizations. So, but this basically makes the binary look like crap in IDA or any other disassembly. You know, it's like it spreads the thing all over. Yet, still, the structure, if you can abstract from that, if your disassembly is good enough, the main structure is going to be pretty much similar. Some functions might be mangled together, but the basic block layout is going to be similar. And uh, the one that is going to change most or only is the, is the flow graph layout. The, the call graph layout doesn't really change that much for, for profile-guided optimization. For inlining, it does, because some functions that might be present in a binary might be inlined and put inside another function. But still, that does not tend to be more than a small percentage of the application when it gets recompiled like that. So it does not affect that much. And that will be the critical cases. So pros of this uh, is very resilient to all these modifications. The, none of them really break it. And because all of these contribute to it, it actually recess. You know, if the flow graph is modified, well, we still have you know, the call graph to look at. If the call graph is modified, we still have the other. If both are modified, well, we try to do as best as we can, and we usually do pretty OK. And uh, so it's not localized at all. So you can release a new piece of malware with actually a whole new set of functionality, like an FTP server somehow hanging out of a thread. But if the rest matches, you're going to still get 80% 
if like th that FTP server, whatever it is, or a spam bot part is like only 20% of the code. And it's not brittle because, well, as we've seen, you can, you can do whatever you want on the binary, change it at the byte level. We don't even look at the instructions for most of the time. So you can do whatever you want. You can add random garbage to it. No big deal. So the cons are that uh, it's computationally quite intensive, so we don't have any hopes of having it running in any, any user machine, just because you need to do all this work. You need to have a database of graphs, and you need to be relatively clever how to go into matching those graphs. So it's not really suited for, for end user machine. Uh, uh, another drawback, uh, but it, this applies to all the others as well. As I said, it requires an unpacked uh, binary. And uh, yeah, we need a full disassembly, and we need proper disassembly tools, which is arguable whether we have them nowadays. It either gets it's not too bad, but you know, I could I could rant about that. So, but how? I mean, if you're wondering how we actually do that, how we compare two graphs, um, it's actually not really that difficult. Uh, the problem itself, telling whether two graphs are isomorphic, that's like the math term for telling that two graphs are exactly identical. It's it's very, very hard, like the kind of thing you don't want to do, or rely on as an algorithm. But um, the good thing is that the graphs they're working with have an extreme amount of information. We have on them, we have uh, APIs and import names. We have uh, libraries, we have entry points, we have exports, there are other entry points. We have data, we have strings. So we can all, we can use all of this as fixed points. So if you have two pieces of malware, we can look for all these common things. We can look for APIs that they use that are in common. Data strings, like URLs, like uh, whatever, names, emails. And we can pinpoint these locations in the two binaries. So we have all these starting points. So it's not, it's not anymore a random graph matching problem. You, you have a lot of starting points. The entry point is common. Every program has to have an entry point. So you can have a, a root edge, basically, a root node to some extent. So using all that actually gives us a really good way of anchoring two graphs to start matching them. And once we have that, I mean, the idea would be of matching this, that if we have uh, two functions that share the context, Ideally, if the, the sub-functions of k and k prime are the same, we would like to say that the functions are the same. That's basically how it works, how it works at the call graph level. So that if these two functions call exactly the same APIs and exactly the same order, but we don't need to run it. We're just look, looking at this assembly. We, we could assume, and this is the only instance in the whole application where these three APIs are used, we could assume that these two functions will be the same if it will be the same family. So. Like mathematically, we would want to achieve the same result by like going from k, mapping it to, to, to the other binary, and getting the children should give the same result as getting the children in the first one and mapping it to the second one. That would be the isomorphism, like the mathematical construct applied to this. But basically, in layman terms, basically means you want to look at the context and make, that the con make sure that the context is the same. Uh, it's similar to what is done in, in some linguistics approach where you try to classify words in the language by looking at their context. If a word is used always with certain kind of nouns or certain kind of verbs, it's very likely to be the same. And you can actually cluster words by just that algo by, by that mechanism. And that's pretty much the same. Look at the context. It has lots of information. So to do that, we need to actually tag all the functions with, uh, and, and assign them some sort of numbers that actually allow us to pinpoint them, whether they're singular or not. And, uh, in our case, we use a, a triplet, a three-dimensional vector, where the information that we encode is the for, for every node, looking at the call graph, every node is going to be a function. So we use as, as, the, as the components of the vector the number of nodes within the function, the number of basic blocks, the number of edges, connections between the basic blocks, and the out degree, the number of sub-functions called within that function. So once we have that, and we have, we have like have all these funny numbers, all these vectors for all the functions in the binary, we start looking at the context, and uh, or already assuming that we already embedded all the information about APIs too. So let's imagine that we have the call graph or subset of a call graph of a very simple program, uh, where we have these values. The values are identical in both, but we have a problem in this case. In in each instance, we have six four two six four two and 332, 332. So looking just at the vectors, we couldn't tell which one, you know, if whether the, the can I use the mouse there? No. Whether this 332 uh, is uh, this one or this one. Obviously, if you look at the context, it's obvious. But if you would uh, just be trying to look at the vectors, you wouldn't know whether just, you know, 
by this number, whether it's that one or that one, or, or this one is the one on top or the second one. But if we just isolate our, ourselves and start looking at the context, in the case of the 762, the red node, which we know is the same because they are unique in the whole call graph, then we can just look at the context and we see that in the, in, in the context they are unique, so we can match them. So once we have that information and embed it into the whole call graph, and I mean some edges in the one on the right, um, we already know, OK, those are matched. The other ones that are left are unique. So I can just continue the process and go to another context. OK, these guys are the same, so I know how to match them, keep going. And now I only have like two functions left on match, which I know are the same. I mean, I know how to match because the signatures are, are unique and everything else is already matched. So by this progressive way of, of analyzing or going much in the malware, I can get a very good accurate view and like incremental view of how it actually maps one to the other. So then once we have this, how we actually calculate a measure, <coughs> a number that tells us whether um, it's similar or not, we, <coughs> we would like to have water. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we like to have some sort of uh, percentage measure, you know, like 0%, 100%, whether the, the, the thing is similar to another. So we can, we can do that by intersection. Thanks. Um, we can have a, there you go. Much better. So by doing an intersection, if we have a set of functions in the whole binary that we know, well, in the two binaries that we know are the same, now what we can do is like get that intersection, the functions that are common for one binary and the other, and uh, divide it by the number of functions in both binaries, like the union of both sets. So if the intersection is pretty close to the union, because we match almost everything, we're going to get pretty close to 1 or to 100%, whatever you, however you calculate it. While if the intersection is two functions, to, that was the only thing you could match because it was the only relevant context, and the total number of functions is 200,000, obviously that's not going to be too similar. And the same if, if, if you have something like a much bigger binary than, than another. Uh, if you match like 100% or, or, or a really high amount of one, of the small one into the big one, but not of the big one into the small one, that's not going to get a high percentage of matching. You will get an idea that is embedded, but you're not going to get 100% because there's lots of functions in the big one that weren't matching the small one. That's actually we are debating sometimes because in some cases we see a lot of use for that at the level of detecting whether some bad guys use something as a library in something else, but as well has the drawback that it, it, sometimes we don't want to know whether something is embedded. Some, we just want to know whether something is, is close. So probably we, we should allow for different operation modes depending on your, your, how you're looking at, at whatever you're looking if it's not malware. So we basically do this, this measure for, for, the, for the call graph, the flow graph, and the instruction. We, we do all these graph matching, the getting the, the similarities, doing the intersections, and the flow graph, call graph, and instructions. And then we have like three different values that tells us the difference, uh, the similarities at different levels. So that's why it's resilient. You, know, you can modify the flow graphs, but the call graph will still pre be pretty close most of the time. And then we basically do a weighted average of these values because we tend to attribute much more uh, weight to the actual call graph. If the call graph is much similar, but the instructions change, we don't really care that much about the instructions. Actually, I can tell funny stories where two different, uh, same binary compiled for two different architectures was much was found to be like 99% similar. And if you had given a really big value to the instructions, that would have been lower. So it's really cool not looking at the instructions because then you can look at different, at the same application compiled for different things and still get a really like com warrior in, in malware where you get compiled for different mobile phones this was able to say that it was 90% similar without looking at the instructions, which is really cool. So we have problems like scaling. This is a computationally intensive algorithm. So, so the way we try to address it, we face, basically first uh, we try to approximate, to just find good candidates to match. I mean, we have a large database. We, we have tried this with several thousand samples. Uh, we really don't want to do like all the pairs. That's not a good idea. So what we tend to do is just select, you know, Anyway, it doesn't make much sense uh, trying to match something that is 100 functions against something that is like 5,000. Both can be malware, but not necessarily going to be too close together. One could be, you know, typical Delphi monster, while another might be a very streamlined C whatever uh, client for something. So we basically try to filter all, all things to, to get some sort of sen uh, set that will make some sense size-wise and structure-wise. And once we have that, 
Um, then we try to actually do the detail matching, where we go to all this detail I just described, going to the cold grass, going, which is much more computationally intensive, but gives us a very definite similarity uh, number or, or, or um, percentage. As well, we discard uh, things that are too close. If things are go beyond a certain threshold, we assume they're identical, and we don't even keep them in the database. Because it doesn't make much sense having like a collection with 20,000 things that are like 99% similar. Because if you get a new one, are you going to be matching against all those? Like, no, not really. It doesn't make much sense. You just want to keep a representative of that collection if it's that close to each other. So at the level of results in what we have been working with, uh, actually, the classification is not really the worst after doing these optimizations. Uh, unpacking and disassembling are. Like unpacking, we're using a, a generic uh, unpacking approach, which probably will be worth a, a talk on its own, and uh, works fairly well. Has limit limitations, obviously. I mean, the, the nastier packers are really nasty, and um, and disassembling takes a while, and we have to improve a lot on what Ida can do, which Ida tends to be the best available commercial solution for that. So it would be nice to have better disassembling engines, and we're working on that. At the level of parallelizing it, most of the components are parallelized. Basically, they are just VMs. We can run as many as we want, and. Um, the only thing that is not parallelized yet is the, is the classification. It would be really nice to run, be able to run a classification for a single sample across multiple processes, instances, threads. But right now, it's something that uh, we don't have yet. Halvar has some runs, some crazy ideas how to do it. We'll see how that, how that goes. He says, next spring, so probably that means 2012, though. <laughs> so we'll see about that. How the system looks like, uh, this is pretty much what, what we have built in-house, and some people are trying. We have a XML RPC server. On top of that, we have a web server GUI, so you can upload samples either from your scripts automated, or like a user can just go and, and upload stuff. And then we have like three different uh, subsystems, the unpacking, just VMs, just fetching stuff from the queue and doing the unpacking if it's needed. Um, then disassembly and analysis, which will generate with all the disassembly and the data in order to do things later, and the classification, which after filtering, we'd actually try to figure out how things are close, if they are, and then it will actually store everything into um, a, a similarity matrix. Uh, how the system looks like or looked like a month, some months ago, it looks a bit different nowadays. Uh, you basically, through the web interface, upload files, and you get uh, a list of things, whether, I mean, this current status, here everything was already done, but you know, it will tell you whether things are is currently unpacking or whatever. Then uh, you can you have the hashes of the files, descriptions, and how long it took to, to process each step. And if you actually want to see the results of the classification, uh, if you go to the actual Java applet view of this, you get like a hierarchy of, of classification, like the closest things, the same families being clustered together, why the different ones tend to. In this case, probably either we're classifying the same the strands of the same family, or that we just add like a threshold really low because most of the time, if you have different families, they just show us separate clusters, totally separate clusters. But you can regulate that index of similarity where you want to split them because it's something that some users might want. Some, some people might want really strict things at the level of, I want to know within this family how they split together into subfamilies, and others want to look, okay, I want to see of all my mail stream which ones are bunkers and which ones are whatever, you know, based on very, very rough structural properties. So can you break this? Uh, we try to give it a lot of thought how to break it. And yeah, there are ways of making it really difficult to, to actually, uh, it's not really breaking, it's actually making it really poor or degrading the performance of the comparison. Because basically, I mean, at, the, at one level, we're capturing a lot. I, I cannot think, well, I can think of one way of capturing more semantics, but nothing that can be really done in the, in, the, in the short term. I mean, the best way would be actually doing this kind of graph analysis at the data flow level. Because if you can actually capture the, the data patterns, the data modifications within a program, you're basically really capturing semantics. So but that's for another day, I guess, because that's, that's going to be some work. But um, of all the approaches I know, this is the one that will capture most of the semantics of the application. So it's difficult to, to think of breaking this without changing much of the semantics of the application. I've seen some cases where we wanted eat too much to samples of the same family, when we look at them, is okay, they're in the same family, the same person kind of made them, but they are so different to some extent, even if it's just obfuscation, that it's almost hard to justify that they should be the same, because they actually changed. 
So it goes a little bit of how you wanna you wanna think about it. Because if you change the semantics, if you change that much the call graph, well, it's not really the same application, right? You know. So that's up to for debate. But yeah, you can do a certain level of obfuscation that makes the, the, the disassembly, trickles the disassembly first. That would be, if you break the disassembly, it breaks most of our, because it relies on that, most of our analysis. But we survive that pretty well. But you can use still obfuscation, like opaque predicates, like jumping into the middle of all the instructions. Um, Young code doesn't really do that much to us. It would be basically, basically confusing the disassemblers. And there are different techniques to do that. But we have different assembling engines we can use nowadays, so we should, we should be able to survive that pretty well. And um, yeah, I mean, the idea would be for, to get the attackers to implement and to, to put a lot of time into really advanced sophistication techniques. Uh, one thing that was discussed, uh, was mentioned to Halbar, and we just talked about was the, was the dispatcher way of where you basically would change a whole application, just having a single function where you will map every single API call. You will uh, uh, assign them a hash, some sort of number, and redirect everything through that. Basically, you end up flattening, to some extent, the whole call graph. You, you don't have that structure anymore. Um, the, the idea would be looking something like this. You know, every single function goes through that dispatcher you know, whenever you want to call some other function. So flattens the call graph. To that, I mean, definitely we lose this, this information. Although, well, if we have to, if we have two samples with the same dispatcher structure, I mean, they're going to look flat both, so not really interesting. But uh, the good thing is that we don't only rely on that. The flow graphs, the actual graph of every function, unless they are all of them very close to each other, which is relatively hard if it's a big application, you're going to have. What about breaking function boundaries? Fooling IDA. So function A is not there anymore, or function B is not there. You know, the, like Microsoft move, put move EDI to EDI for hot patching, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it broke IDA 4.8, so it has to come out with 4.9. Yeah. So if you change every red instruction into pop EBX, jump EBX, if you, you know, change well, entry points. We don't use either as function recognition stuff. We have our own for reasons like that. So, <laughs> and as well, we don't use either as flow reconstruction code because it cannot handle like chunked, uh, multi chunk things and all these. Uh, pro uh, Profile of guide optimization. When you start sharing basic blocks between functions, either goes woo, so <laughs> really it's like it goes crazy. So we have our own staff that basically reconstructs the flow and doesn't care whether things are the same or not. It's gonna get all the functions and it's gonna get all the stuff. So we know we've been working a little bit with it, so we know what limitations it has. Still, there there are limitations. There are ways we could you could break it, but I don't think at that level uh, that it would be that bad. But well, you know. It, give some people time and they will figure out the way. <laughs> so at the level of functions, as long as there is distinctive functions, as long as you have like a big function or two big functions, you know, the, the, the listener or the, or the spam bot part or, or the spreading algorithm or the dropper that are significantly different from the rest of the functions, you, we will be able to match that to each other. We won't have the context, but we may still get a high percentage of matching. Uh, definitely it will degrade it, but that's the good thing. It degrades more or less gracefully. It doesn't stop working at all. So that, that's, that's, that's a good part for it. So well, this will be the discussion on that. Um, so yeah, it deteriorates, but doesn't really go into, into, into decay and totally. And as a last remark, which I seem I'm making a pretty good time after all, would be that the, the worst things for us are uh, virtual CPUs because that really removes a lot of the logic. The basically, the idea would be that you generate um, a software CPU and you compile your application for that software CPU architecture. And then your malware runs, basically, an emulator for that virtual CPU. And uh, so you are basically abstract that. The disassembly view, you only see the virtual CPU. The actual logic of the malware is running at a higher level. So from the assembly point of view, it doesn't really capture any semantics of the application. You just see it like, you know, you basically see all the mnemonic resolution, all the register addressing. So it's really, really abstracted. So in order to overcome that, and well, things like Tamida, which actually these CPUs change all the time, uh, they are not the same. It's not like, oh, if you figure out the way it's made, you can actually make something against it specifically. You would really have to make it generic because it changes all the time. It's like multi, m multiple architectures that CISC and RISC, and they're polymorphic in addition. So it's, it's, those guys have a lot of free time. And um, so that, that's difficult just because it removes you from the semantics. And it's, it's relatively easy to keep doing that by just recompiling or, or recreating the VM. 
So, so that's, that's tough. But still, if there are some similarities between the VM in one sample or another, it might stick, it still match something. But I would say that's one of the hardest challenges. So far, we haven't really been, uh, we have seen samples packed with Temida and other things, but not really widespread. Like the Storm family usually uses a million tricks of their own, but I haven't seen one packed with a VM, as far as I know. But really trivial to do anyway. But that would be one of the hardest challenges because removing the semantics. Do you see a lot that use the dispatcher approach? Uh, no, actually, not that we, that we have seen. It's something that theoretically we have discussed and not really difficult to do, but I don't remember I've seen any. So I couldn't give you performance figures if it actually matches or not, but I would tend to think we would do okay. So, more? I'm done. Any other questions? You're unpacking uh, with a virtual machine, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, well, also can, you, can you also have a dynamic uh, yes. stuff as well? we can, and we thought of that, and. Uh, that would be really cool because you could, as, yeah, you could embed mainly for for actually detecting when the unpacking is basically done. Because you know, if you start getting lots of APIs happening, it's like, oh, okay, now now things are happening. But um, you know, it's on the queue of things to do. <laughs> the what? Can the bytes and have data flow as well, I guess. Yeah, we have total control over the VM. It's Python controlled, so you know I can do whatever I want. It's low, but so we can analyze, we can dump the memory, we have all the context, we have all the API, we can see all the kernels. So if things try to do nasty things, call syscall. I don't care. I can intercept everything. So that's a good thing. I mean, I have a syscall interceptor, so it can actually go straight to that. I don't care. I'll see it as, as if it will be API calls, all the same. So that, that's nice. I mean, the unpacking technology we have, I think, is pretty decent. But um, still, there are things that are really convoluted. Like I was saying, a storm, one of the things is, is like the simplest thing on Earth, but it's really nasty, is like a, a couple of samples we got like two weeks ago, like at the entry point, they have a loop that does nothing. It's just two instructions, but it's done like four billion times. So in a normal CPU, that runs in under a second. But in a software emulator, it's not running under a second. So our main problem actually, I mean, all, all our unpacking will run perfectly. It just takes long. So, so basically, we just have to optimize. Whenever nothing interesting is happening, try to run as close as native speed. And actually, the emulator we're using should be able to do se several tens of millions of instructions per second. So that worst case scenario, we could optimize, optimize for those cases to run at emulator's native speed, because uh, otherwise, there's a lot of Python overhead. Um, it should run within acceptable terms. I mean, we, we don't intend to do this real time. Uh, we have like something like 10, 15 minutes to get the classification done is acceptable for our current use of it. You know, maybe in the future we try to attack more problems with it and we want it faster. But you know, hopefully we can just throw computers at it. That's a way, nice way of solving problems. Anything else? into incorporating measures other than structured classification uh, into the same, uh, like generating a numerical framework that includes things like uh, analysis of static of data in the actual binary or things like n-grams or things like that, and combining them as both for comparison purposes as well as an overall better picture kind of thing? Uh, no, we are really, really haven't thought of that because we consider quite some of them to be relatively weak or not contributing that much over what the, um, the graph approach, the structural approach could do. But I mean, I've played with histogram approach, n-gram approach, and, and it's useful in very constrained cases, maybe even shell code analysis or things like that. But uh, at the level of, of malware, I cannot see any big uh, added value to it. I mean, that could be done, done sure. And you know, it might be useful even to pro be provided as an API for people to do their own things, sure. We need to be a bit bigger to implement all that stuff. But I mean, it, it would be fun. I would love to do that. You yeah, know, as, as like as malware evolves and uh, people start uh, more people start getting into better countermeasures, like something like just even simple data analysis would probably take you a long way when it comes to the virtual oh. CPUs and VMs. And totally. Things. If we could do the data flow, data analysis a, a, in a proper way fast, but that would be the way to go because there's so many obfuscations that get totally destroyed by that. Like if you look at the media, lots of the crap that it does. Uh, it's just tedious, and uh, it's not really difficult. It just takes you forever. And if you had a bit of exactly, that would be the biggest problem. If we could do it, that would be the greatest thing. Because then we could actually move into this more semantic, real semantic thing. If you can actually abstract what is happening to the data, that's basically what the application is telling you. So doing diff on that, that would be awesome. But you know, probably we need like new computers for that.
Hopefully not. But. Anybody else? Yeah. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed it.